Um, my name's Chris, Chris Knight. Um, I, I'm getting on a bit, so I retired quite a while ago, but I'm still researching here at UCL um, into human origins. So that's what I do. Um, sometimes people tell me that it's uh, helpful if I give um, a one-minute version of what I'm going to say, and then a five-minute version, and then the whole thing. So I'm going to give you to start with the one-minute version. The first word ever to be spoken by the human species was spoken by women. And we know what the word was. It was no. Okay, now the five minute version, five minutes or so. Um, I'm certainly not going to be arguing that there was ever a time when women were communicating in brilliantly grammatical language with noun phrases and verb phrases, while on the other hand, men were still grunting. I'm not really saying that. It's perfectly clear that when language evolved, males and females, men and women, were equally involved in this amazing um, development. So let me just say what I am going to be arguing. In order for words to work, remember that words are very cheap signals. We often say words are cheap. Uh, and behind that is the idea they can be lies. Um, that means that for language to work, you have to have really very unusual, unusual for the animal world, very unusual levels of trust. So I'm arguing about what it was which produced enough community-wide trust for this strange system of words in combination to work. Given that there's nothing remotely like language, I'm talking about grammatical, grammatically complex language, nothing remotely like language in the rest of the animal world. A animals, of course, have very sophisticated, brilliantly uh, effective, subtle systems of communication. But words and rules, grammar, if you look at our chimpanzee or other uh, great ape closest relatives, not a hint of grammar in their vocal calls. Um, so we need to understand what the obstacle to the development of anything remotely like grammar, what that obstacle was in our ancestors and in monkeys and apes to this day, and how that obstacle, whatever it was, was removed. What it was that enabled the flowering of, the cr of, of language, this extraordinarily um, capacity which we humans have and which actually is part of our nature. Every child is born with a kind of language instinct. This is something that Noam Chomsky taught us. You don't have to teach a child grammar. It's got an appetite. It's got, it's got, a, it's got a feeling that it needs to acquire this complex um, theoretical structure which a, the grammar of a language is. It's obviously born with, a, in that sense, a, a language instinct. Uh, you can just about teach chimpanzees especially bonobos, you can teach them a little bit of language, but they find it really hard, and they never, they, in a way, they really never quite get it. Of course, because it's a human system, and we probably can't get their system, but it's certainly difficult to, just to argue that chimpanzees have got a language instinct, and yet humans have. Right, okay. Fixing the mic, because we started recording these talks. <coughs> So whereas with all the other instincts we have, the sex instinct, the maternal instinct, aggression, I mean, you can think of all kinds of instincts, we can see where they came from. We can see, looking at non-human primates, we can see, okay, humans are like them, maybe a little bit different, but you can see some continuity. When it comes to the language instinct, where did that come from? There doesn't seem to be a trace of it um, in other animals. So, um, trust was the the social factor which enabled language to evolve. That's what I'm going to be arguing. And now let's look at what it is which is the deepest cause of mistrust in a non-human primate system. Take a group of chimpanzees. What is the deepest, what's the root of the 
conflicts, the internal conflicts, sometimes the violence, which characterizes their social life. It's not that they don't cooperate, they cooperate quite a lot. But you wouldn't like to live in a chimpanzee social system. We would find it extremely unpleasant. Um, and at the root of it is sexual conflict. Um, so males want sex, the alpha male tends to get quite a lot of sex, um, tends to be a roving male going from one female to the other. And now and again when a female comes into oestrus, um, this has been described, the, the males go kind of, bit, they, go, they go berserk, they go crazy and um, chase all over the place, sometimes you know, fight each other of course, and uh, the, the females and the, and the babies kind of get out of the way when that's going on. So not a lot of trust. And the key thing is this really, is that non-human primates, when they communicate with each other, when they vocalize, they're looking for hard to fake signals. They're looking for evidence that the, that the, the vocalization is true. So just imagine, imagine ourselves. I mean, it's, uh, sp supposing I've just robbed a bank with my mate and we're discussing afterwards who put the, the loot where and, he, and it might, he tells me he's put it under the staircase in a certain block and I'm not quite sure I trust him. <laughs> Can you see what's going to happen now? I'm not going to be interested too much if I don't trust him in his words. And can you, you can probably tell me what I'm going to be looking at. I'm going to be trying to make eye contact and see whether his eyes wobble a bit. I'm looking for any sweat on his face. I'm looking for little telltale signs. I'm like a lie detector now. Telltale signs that what he's saying is, is true. Um, so can you see what's happening? If I don't trust you, then I'm going to look behind the words to body language, which is hard to fake. And it seems as if chimpanzees are kind of doing that all the time. They're, look, they're, 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 not, they're not accepting vocalizations which could be easy to fake. They're, they're forcing the signalers to fall back on hard to fake body language. And that's because trust is never, never too high. And chimpanzees want direct evidence that what's being communicated is true. So for example, if a, if a chimpanzee's um, found food, it will give a, a, a food call. And that's really, the food call is a, is a kind of this, this, it's like audible salivation. The chimpanzee is excited about the food, it's making a sound. And any other chimpanzee can kind of guess from the sound, not only that there is food, but that it's good quality or bad food, and perhaps even the, the kind of food from the kind of sound being made. Because that it's, it's not that it's entirely uh, involuntary, they can certainly choose or not choose to make the sound up to a point. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but to be honest, when a chimpanzee found, has found food, it's, it has to really make an effort not to convey its excitement uh, vocally. So that's convincing. I mean, the, the most, perhaps the simplest way of explaining it uh, with a different species is to think of a cat, um, a cat purring. You know, it's not telling you in words that it's happy, but that purring sound, which we're all familiar with, stroking a cat, it, that's audible happiness. Okay, and, and, and although that's, that's maybe a bit of an extreme case, animal signaling generally is um, it, it's hard to fake and the sounds, because they're linked to the emotions and linked to the body, constitute evidence of the message. There's a causal relationship between the form of the signal uh, and, its, and its meaning. With language, it's very, very strange because there's absolutely no connection between the form and the meaning. Um, and it's not just that words could be lies. From a chimpanzee point of view, every single word of language is already a kind of lie in the sense that it's already fictional. It's, it's, it's already detached from reality in the neighborhood, either the body or the, or the environment which is causing the body to react in a certain way. So from a chimpanzee point of view, everything about language is already a lie. It's already fictional. It's a kind of pretense, intentional pretense, even before you've said anything. Um, and the amount of trust needed to get language off the ground, it's really quite remarkable. And in a certain sense, I'm going to explain this perhaps later, you actually require infinite trust to get the kind of thing which we call language, because language consists of signals which are not just relatively cheap, they're actually digital. So there's actually no cost involved in the distinction between one 
word and another. So I could be saying, um, uh, just two of us have met, and, um, and I say to somebody who's just gone off, um, OK, um, we'll meet you tomorrow. And I could say, we'll eat you tomorrow. And all I've done is remove a consonant from, from the verb. It's made a difference of life and death at absolutely zero cost to me. Uh, it would cost a huge amount for a chimpanzee to make a difference that great. It would have to an enormous amount of bodily, emotional energy to produce such a different meaning. Whereas we can, we can switch between meanings actually at zero cost. And a zero cost signal implies that the amount of trust is infinite. Of course, infinite trust is impossible. We can't, nobody can be that trusting. But there's a, there's a theoretical sense in which the level of trust has veered off towards the infinite end of the, uh, of the scale. OK, that was the five-minute version. Um, and now I'm just going to introduce the topic a bit, and then I'll tell you what, what I think. Um, and um, what, uh, if you want to check it out, it, the, the best version of what I'm going to be saying on the internet at the moment is an article called Wild Voices in Current Anthropology last year. I think it's the August issue uh, called Wild Voices, and it's authored by myself and my colleague here, Jerome Lewis. Um, and uh, I'll say a bit more about that um, later on. Okay. The question of the origin of language has now become recognized as quite possibly the hardest problem in science. Um, some of you may think that's a bit odd. Surely we've got Darwinism. Surely we know how the hands evolved, the brain evolved, you know, our anatomy and physiology evolved. Surely we must have some theory, some more or less accepted theory about the evolutionary emergence of language. No, we don't. <laughs> um, it's a complete mystery in the sense that it's not that we don't have, we don't have theories. The, the problem is the other way around. <laughs> we, have, we have far too many theories and there's almost zero agreement as to a theory, um, which is kind of unusual in science. Usually by this stage, if you've been working on a problem for a while, you'll find at least some scientists starting to agree with each other. And I'm, I'm arguing, actually, that the reason that the problem is insoluble it's because there's been an underlying assumption about the social framework within which language and our species evolved. So I'm saying if you take patriarchy as your background assumption, there's a good reason why you're not going to get language. Because I'm going to argue that under patriarchy, there's never going to be sufficient, mistrust, uh, sufficient trust across the community for it even to be possible for language to begin to evolve, let alone for language of the complex kind that we have um, to become um, established. So it's a very difficult problem. And in fact, over history, the last uh, century or so, it's actually been regarded as so difficult that it's best to just n avoid it. So in the, in the later part of the 19th century, after Charles Darwin published his um, Origin of the Species and The Descent of Man, um, suddenly, for a while, um, evolutionary theories were fashionable. And Victorian armchair theorists thought, OK, well, Darwin's explained that we evolved from some kind of ape-like ancestor. There must be an evolutionary explanation for the emergence of language in the species. And so we had a whole lot of theories. And some of you may know what those theories are called. Have you ever heard of the bow-wow theory? Um, or the ding-dong theory, or the heave-ho, heave-ho theory, or the ta-ta theory. I mean, they had all these theories. The bow-wow theory, of course, is that you make sounds like, bow-wow is supposed to be like a dog, and quack-quack is supposed to be like a duck, and so that's the theory. And then the heave-ho theory is that you had people like doing lots of work together and you know, co coordinating their work by making sounds which help them to you know, cooperate. So we had all these theories, and um, far too many theories. And then in 1866, the Paris Linguistic Society, which was then the center of theoretical linguistics in, in the Western world, the, the Paris Linguistic Society, in its inaugural conference, um, published some statutes. And the statutes said that they will accept no papers on either of these two topics, either the search for a universal language or the question of the origin of language. It was a taboo. <laughs> And because the Paris Linguistic Society was so preeminent, their taboo was adopted by the 
linguistic society here, in America, Germany, right across the world, and there was a, a complete ban on anyone discussing the origin of language. And the ban lasted a very long time, with a, one or two sort of marginal exceptions. That, that effective ban on even discussing the origin of language lasted until 1990, believe it or not. And then in 1990, suddenly, something happened. Um, one of the key books was by um, a Creole specialist, um, Derek Bickerton, working in Hawaii, and he wrote a book called Language and Species. And he argued very persuasively, he said, look, we scientists, we've worked out what happened in the first three seconds after the Big Bang, um, 14 billion years ago, and we can even work out roughly what happened in the first few nanoseconds. So how, how is it possible to say we can't, with all the evidence we might have, work out roughly what happened a mere 100,000 years or 200,000 years ago with the emergence of language? And why should there be a taboo on that subject when in other areas of science, origins is, is a perfectly legitimate um, topic to, 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 to address? So that book um, changed things. So did another article. Um, uh, I won't go into all the different articles, but I mean, uh, 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 suddenly there was an explosion of interest in the origin of language. It's like the, um, the floodgates had been opened, and there was an avalanche of theories. And once again, we had, in a sense, it wasn't that we didn't have enough theories, we had rather too many theories. Um, this, I mean, I don't know, and they're still around, those theories. I mean, I've heard a theory not too long ago that maybe, I mean, okay, I'll give you a social theory. Um, we now know that early Homo, maybe a million or more years ago, was scavenging, scavenging for food, and what our ancestors did a long time ago was they would uh, confront a lion who might have made a kill, and having left the lion to eat quite a lot of the antelope, we would then have to go towards that lion and try to persuade the lion to leave some of the, maybe leave a leg that, for us to eat. And of course you'd need a lot of courage and it's probably not best not to go on your own. You'd better go with you know, several people. And, the, and it's, I've heard it argued that that kind of scavenging, because it involved a collective, would have produced enough trust to get language off the ground. Um, okay, it's a theory, um, but it's not a very good theory. Um, if it was as easy as that, you'd find at least some elements of grammar and language getting off the ground with other species that do collective hunting, or like wolves and hunting dogs and all sorts of other animals. And of course chimpanzees themselves, they, they collectively hunt um, colobus monkeys. The mystery is why we get zero language among other animals, if by language we mean grammatically complex language. Um, and these attempts to find some elements of cooperation in other species or in our ancestors, and as if that can explain things. So they're just, I, honestly, if it was that easy, we would, have, we, would have, we would have found an explanation. The other explanations, that, which are not social, tend to be mechanistic. Um, and I've come across the argument that maybe the reason why chimpanzees can't um, talk, and maybe why our an different ancestors couldn't talk, was because of an inflexible tongue. Uh, Jerome and I deal with this in the Wild Voices paper. I mean, we just say, we just, I think we make hay of it, actually. We just say an inflexible tongue. How could any animal have an inflexible tongue? I mean, you've got to, even, what's the tongue for? It's for manipulating food in your mouth and tasting it. And an inflexible tongue would mean you couldn't eat, you'd, you'd choke on your food. It's the most flexible organ in the entire body. And what we argue in the Wild Voices article is that actually, Far from it being an inflexible um, organ it being the problem, the, the problem is actually the tongue is too flexible. It's so flexible that it can lie. And if you're, as I was saying earlier on, if you don't trust somebody, you, 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 you probe aspects of bodily behaviour which are not flexible, which can't be faked. And so the argument would be, and this is a, a very important point, the tongue, of course, it's the, it's the primary articulator in language. We have a lot of articulators, tongue, teeth, soft palate, and all those things, but the, we call languages tongues, don't we? And that's because the, the primary articulator is that very flexible part of our mouth. When chimpanzees vocally communicate, they leave the tongue out of it. It's just not there. Um, so that's the mystery. If they've got, they've got a perfectly flexible tongue, maybe not as flexible as ours, but they don't even use what flexibility 
they've got in that organ. They just leave the tongue out of it. And of course, I'm arguing, we're arguing, that they leave the tongue out of it because listeners want evidence. And anything manipulable could be fake, could be lies. So listeners, with uh, chimpanzee listeners, they, they force each other to use parts of the body which are not easy to move around, which are, they, 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 they only accept and act upon signals which are difficult to fake, not signals which are easy um, to fake. And I should mention, I'm just doing a little bit of a survey now, I should mention a very, a very salient, a very prominent theory. Um, Noam Chomsky is the world's number one theoretical linguist, has been since the 60s, since the, the late 50s and 60s. Um, and he has an argument about the origin of language. Uh, and it's this. Language emerged in one step from nothing. So you had a completely inarticulate ancestor, and he envisages maybe a cosmic ray shower hitting this creature, and the cosmic ray shower caused a mutation in one gene that is a big mutation, and it installed in one instant a fully functional language organ, which had inside it um, universal grammar. And actually, he goes further. He, had, he says it had inside it all the words that would ever be needed by humans from then on, including words like carburetor uh, and, um, and, and so on. I, I mean, that is a theory. Again, I have to say it's uh, not a very good one. <laughs> um, so, we, we, you know, we have these different theories. Um, and um, I've been, when I wrote my book, Blood Relations, um, in 1991, anyone that's looked at this book will, will, will have noticed something, which is that it covers a huge amount. It covers the origin of uh, ritual, kinship, economics, uh, you know, so many different aspects of human symbolic culture, what it means to be human. It, it leaves out something. It leaves out language. And the reason I left out language because I, is because I, I just realized it was a hugely difficult challenge. And in particular, um, I realized that in order to deal with that topic, I needed to read up on Noam Chomsky, the world's number one linguist. And my problem was that every time I opened a book by Noam Chomsky or an article by Noam Chomsky, it seemed to me completely nonsense. I couldn't, make a, I couldn't get my head around it at all. Um, and I was very, you know, I, you know I, I just had the usual attitude. I'm not a nuclear physicist, and if I read papers in nuclear physics, I, you know, it looks like nonsense. But I know that behind it is real science. I've got to do more work. Um, so initially, that was my attitude. Chomsky is obviously a, a genius. The fact that I don't understand it is, is my problem, not his. And the trouble was that I worked and worked and worked on it, and even at the end of you know, a long, long time, it, it still seemed like complete and utter nonsense. Um, so what I did was I thought, OK, I'm not going to solve this problem. It's too, it's too big for anybody to solve. Um, and so in 1996, I teamed up with um, Jim Herford, uh, a linguist at the University of Edinburgh, and we decided, right, we're going to need help on this. Why don't we set up a, a conference um, inviting everybody with any possible research relevant to the problem of the origin of language? They can be primatologists, they can be archaeologists, paleontologists, geneticists, linguists, historical linguists. I mean, just get everyone together and let's really home in on this problem. So it was a very good move. Um, we had our first uh, conference in 1996. Uh, um, um, we then published um, the volume with myself um, um, and, 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 and Jim and Michael Sadek Kennedy as the editors. And then that, that conference series has been going on ever since. Every two years we have this massive international conference. The, the coming one in Easter is going to be in, in Torun in Poland. And um, I've been involved in so many volumes, edited volumes, aspects of the, of the of evolution of language, the evolution emergence of language, the prehistory of language. <laughs> it goes on and on and on. So we've been publishing all these volumes over the years, uh, and um, I have a sad uh, message to convey to all of you, which is at the end of much more than you know, a decade, ever since 1996, it's what is nearly, tw uh, nearly uh, 22 years, isn't it? Um, we're still no nearer a solution. There's as much disagreement now <laughs> uh, as, there was, uh, as there was when we began. I, perhaps I should say, when we first began, we were uh, in a rather amusing but e exasperating way aware of something, which was that coming from all our different disciplines, 
what we lacked was language. We didn't have a shared language through which we could even communicate with each other. We were just completely exasperated. I, just, I, th I, I thought language was a system for communicating thoughts and ideas. I didn't realize language is a, a computer module in the head that you think to yourself with. But I just found out that you know, the, the range of different views, is even what language is, was so wide that we were all at cross purposes. We're a little bit better now. There's a, there's a little bit more, at least, tolerance of each other. We, weren't, we were very nice to each other. We weren't, we weren't having the linguistic wars. There wasn't blood on the carpet. We weren't literally screaming and shouting at each other, as can happen in these conferences. Um, but we were, you know, we were fairly exasperated. Now, uh, maybe there's a little bit more convergence around some of the issues. I do think, by the way, that the issue of trust as the primary factor if, trust, if sufficient trust is there, language will get off the ground. If there's no, not sufficient trust, it won't. I think that is probably something which I've contributed and which has now become maybe not completely the consensus, but it, at, at any rate, it's pretty widely um, accepted. Um, and I also wanted to say something about the relevance of the topic. Now, a moment ago, I mentioned the theory that language emerged in one instant, in one single mutation from no precursor. It was just a random mutation. For me, that theory, I can see why it's there. You couldn't get more apolitical than that theory. You couldn't have a theory which was more sort of intentionally irrelevant. OK, language just emerged by an accident and it was just a gene. If you wanted to find the most irrelevant possible theory, that would be a very good candidate, wouldn't it? Um, so I'm, I'm actually thinking that the origin of language is not without social, um, gender, and other implications. And um, I, I'm not too happy about the kind of science which pretends to be politically neutral. I think a lot of these supposedly neutral um, versions of science do have an agenda. Um, and it's better to be open with your agenda if you've got one. Um, and so, I, I, again, I, I, I mean, we, if uh, I'm a kind of scientist, I'm an, an evolutionary anthropologist, um, but all of us, we're, we're humans. We have got our emotions, we have got our agendas, we have got our politics. Um, and I think it's fairly important to put a question like today's um, topic in the context of things um, happening today. And we have this extraordinary movement just recently. In fact, it's on the news today, this Oxfam scandal about sexual harassment. Of course, it all exploded with the Jimmy Savile um, scandal um, in the BBC. And then we've had Harvey Weinstein. And we've had the Me Too movement. So we've had this massive kind of uprising of women against badly behaved bosses overwhelmingly no. Um, and um, if, you, if you think that science is irrelevant to politics, I would definitely suggest think again. Um, what's happening around the world at the moment is, is a kind of anger and resistance which I don't think is totally unprecedented. When I began with my one minute version, I was saying to you, wasn't I? I was saying, if you had to put this whole theory that I'm going to be giving to you in one minute, you'd have to say the first word ever spoken was spoken by women. And the word was no. Um, and uh, I then went on to say that if you assume patriarchy as your background, and some, there are people who would assume you know, patriarchy is just part of human nature. It's, we've always had it. It goes right back to origins. Chimpanzees are patriarchal, other you know, primates are patriarchal. And my view, if, if you assume that, that assumption itself is making the problem of the origin of language insoluble. Because for language to emerge, you have to have trust. And I'm arguing that that trust had to involve sexual trust. And I'm arguing that in the establishment of the kind of trust necessary to make language possible, the female of the species had to play a decisive role. Because if males are allowed to sort of rove around using power, using threat, using violence sometimes to get sex, 
if that's the game and, and the female of the species is kind of in any way colluding with that so that the male of the species hasn't much choice if they want sex but to play along with that, that's not going to give you anything remotely like the levels of public accountability, honesty, public morality, some bottom-up notion of the rule of law which would be necessary to get language um, off the ground. And just how to link to that is this idea that some people have had rather naive and optimistic ideas about social media and the internet. I mean, the, when the internet first came on the scene, I remember people saying, oh, this is, this is language writ large. We're now able to communicate with each other right across the planet. We can use, and now, of course, we can use the digital me media to, you know, be in each other's houses with, with you know, video and stuff. But all, we all know, don't we, that the social media, I mean, let's be honest about it, it's a cesspit of racism, sexism, abuse, as well as wonderful things as well, of course. But somehow, you know, there's something, there's something if anyone thinks there's some way in which the digital communication media are bringing us all together, um, there is that potential, but there's something else needed to, make, to realize that potential, to allow human language, maybe amp amplified through these digital media, to actually embrace the planet um, and, uh, and start to care for it. So that's kind of background. And maybe the most important thing to say is that the whole idea um, that patriarchy has always existed, and certainly the whole idea within evolutionary biology and, 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 and biological anthropology that patriarchy has always existed, that's been completely exploded. And the book you need is this one, Sarah Bluffer Hurdy, Mothers and Others. Um, came out in 2009. And uh, Sarah Hurdy is one of the great giants of 20th and early 21st century science. She's one of the great founders of selfish gene theory. You've probably heard of selfish gene theory and you may have heard of Richard Dawkins or you may have heard of Bob Trivers or John Maynard Smith or E.O. Wilson. I mean, maybe you haven't heard of these people, <laughs> but these are the great, if you like, fathers of this modern version of Darwinism. Well, Sarah Hurdy was one of those um, and she's absolutely brilliant and she's extremely authoritative and has made a big impact with this um, book. So just to put this into context a little bit, it, it's quite a rational argument which I've always held, which is that language has got something to do with cooperation. And the classical Marxist view is that labor was the context within which language evolved. So man the tool maker, <coughs> making tools, using tools, cooperating in the hunt, this new phenomenon, this new activity, the production of your own resources, um, was what brought humans together sufficiently for language to begin to evolve. That's good. I, th I, I think that's a, a correct theory, that basic Marxist theory. But what Hurd has done is, is tweak it quite substantially because she's argued that yes, cooperation in production was absolutely essential. But what was the most uh, time-consuming, laborious, burdensome form of labor for um, evolving humans? Childcare. And it was the increase, I've, I've talked about this before, I can't go into it all, otherwise we'll be here all, the, all evening. Perhaps I will just ask how many of you here were here for the last few weeks? Um, uh, quite a lot, that's quite good actually. Okay, that's that. And how many of you are completely new this evening? Oh my god, more, slightly more, I think, or at least 50 50. Okay, I'm, I'm if you forgive me, I'm gonna suggest that you you look at the videos <laughs> for the last few um, weeks' lectures because otherwise we will never get to language. I know all too well I can be go completely off track. Um, but basically, as our ancestors, distant ancestors, came out of the um, forests about five, six million years ago, began walking on two legs. We were facing new dangers from predators, particularly lions and, uh, and other big cats, clustered together, seeking safety in numbers. Therefore, we're in larger and more complex social groups, putting pressure on the brain, the social brain, to become more complex, to handle c social and political difficulties, putting pressure on mothers to produce babies with those larger brains. Large brain babies mature more slowly, take more effort to feed, need higher quality food, mean additional burdens on childcare. Two things then happened. First of all, the evolving human female began 
needing help from somebody um, to offset the load, the childcare load. And the first person she turned to was mum. So women started living with mother, living with mother, living with mother. And living with mother means you're probably living with your sisters. So evolving human females began to babysit one another's babies because of the, you know, that's, that's the only way they could afford these very burdensome, costly babies. And then something even more amazing happened, which is more where I come in. After a, a long time, the, the, solid, the solidarity developed among the evolving human female in the course of working out childcare. And perhaps I should just quickly mention, I'm not going to go into it, but a chimpanzee, a chimpanzee is a single mum. And she's a single mum because she dare not give her baby to anyone else. She has to cling on to it. Where, when she, where she is, she'll be without any kin. She has to move out to have sex into a neighbouring group where her mum and sisters and other kin aren't there. And if she was to allow someone else to hold her baby, they would very likely harm it. There's a, a very substantial amount of infanticide goes on in, in non-human primate groups. Partly male infanticide, but it isn't just males, it's females that kill each other's babies. And when they kill babies, they tend to eat them. And not, that's not rampant. It's not, it's not the only thing that happens but it's a significant risk. Um, and so, there's only w so what Sarah Hurdy is saying is that humans are the babysitting ape. We are the only great ape where the female is no longer a single mum because she can trust her mum, her sisters, and eventually others, including males, to hold the baby. And in order to do that, the females had to um, check each other out and, w and work out their one another's intentions. So her book is called Mothers and Others, but the subheading is The Evolutionary Origins of Mutual Understanding. She's saying you wouldn't hand over your baby to just anyone. You want to be sure they're going to be nice to your baby. Um, and so that's the background to um, the whole story of human evolution, the kind of what she calls emotional modernity, the kind of psychology that humans developed emerged out of collective, actually collective, um, childcare. There's another book, which is a, um, a bit earlier, 1996 actually, which, which in some ways anticipates at least some of those themes. So again, some of you may have heard of Robin Dunbar. Again, he's a major figure. Again, working within the surface gene framework. Maybe somebody, if you haven't heard previous lectures, you might be a bit upset about surface genes. Surface genes are not selfish, they just replicate themselves. A, a gene which replicates the competition very shortly isn't a gene. <laughs> that selfish genes make extremely loving, kind, generous, courageous individuals, or sometimes, of course, they make very selfish individuals. It all depends on things. But anyway, this is Robin Dunbar, and he wrote this book, Grooming, Gossip, and the Evolution of Language, in 1996. And Dunbar, in some ways, anticipated the idea that the female of the species played a decisive role, um, because he argues mm, that actually it, uh, humans, prop the, the most f firm forms of alliance between evolving humans would have been between females. They would have formed alliances to resist harassment, including sexual harassment, and the danger of infanticide. And that one of the ways in which language evolved, he says, was that, that um, the kind of grooming that non-human primates need to do to keep each other as allies, what they do is they, they pick fleas out of each other's skin. And even if there aren't any fleas, it's nice to be groomed. So somebody that's grooming you a lot, you know they're, they're, a, they're a friend. They're, they're committed because it's a costly signal. You're spending, somebody's spending time grooming you when they could be grooming somebody else. Um, uh, and so grooming is a way of bonding. And what Robin argued was that as group sizes became bigger, it was harder and harder to maintain your alliances with so many different people and a new, cheaper form of grooming um, had to be developed. And he called it vocal grooming. You made sounds to each other to kind of convince your allies that you're their friend. That theory is kind of good, and it's also not very good. <laughs> uh, Camilla Power, part of our radical anthropology group, gave a lecture um, a couple of weeks ago. She quite savagely attacked that whole idea, just simply pointing out that the, point, the reason why grooming is convincing is because it's precisely because it's costly. Someone's grooming you, and they're not grooming somebody else, and they're having to put a lot of time into, into it. Why would just making a few sounds have anything like the, the value of, of real, tangible grooming? And I thought Robin sort of agreed with that because he started to change his theory a little bit and began to realize and argue 
that actually what happened was that um, singing, um, not, not really grammatical language, was what began to evolve in the human species. Uh, singing being not really language, but more like vocal ritual, which does take a lot of time and is a sign of commitment. A whole bunch of people singing together, I mean, probably you know this, and I know, I, you know, playing music together, that really does bond you, but singing together clearly would bond you because it, because it does take so much time. So that's a very, um, rather interesting first shot at the theory that I'm going to be um, outlining here. But anyway, Sarah Hurdy went a lot further with it. Sarah, Sarah, by the way, doesn't quite get to language. Um, and that's because she's a biological anthropologist and she's sticking within her remit. She simply says anything to do with symbolic culture is kind of outside my sphere of expertise. And so she stops her story just at the point when symbolic culture, including language, was beginning to get off the ground. Um, and Camilla Power has taken her theory, um, that final step, into language. And, but but, but Hurdy is um, a colleague of ours, and she's been very supportive of Camilla's work um, and my work. Um, right, OK, that, that's all introduction. And a um, little bit more to say before I get to the nugget, the sort of heart of the, th of the theory. Um, you would assume, wouldn't you, that if language has got an, um, a genetic basis, if there's some kind of language instinct that every human child is born with, it must have evolved. And the mechanism for evolution of anything genetic is Darwinism, Darwinian natural selection. So um, the, f the, the, the quick way of describing Darwinism is to call it descent with modification, which means you have to have something as a precursor which with a, s a slight modification can move you in the direction of your novel adaptation. And a classic example might be um, legs. Where, how did legs evolve? And the sort of popular story, I suppose, is that the, there would have been a fish that was living on mud flats, hopping in and out of the water, and it, it survived better if its fins were quite, quite stubby. And stubby, stubby fins meant you could go from one pond to another pond across the mud and, and, and be OK. And so the, the, the short version of that is, OK, to get legs, you need something to work on, and maybe fins were what you started with. Well, the problem with, <laughs> the problem with spoken language is this. What in primate vocal communication is the precursor? What is it that you've got to start working on to make the changes that will lead to grammatically complex speech? Um, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to give you my own attempt at um, a bit of chimpanzee language. Don't worry about me. <laughs> I'm all right. It's going to be a little bit demanding because it's emotionally difficult and costly to do a chimpanzee pant hoot. Uh, uh, I was kind of taught this um, by a, a colleague in the Radical Anthropology Group many years ago, uh, Andrew Fowler, who's, who lives and breathes chimpanzees and bonobos. He, he lives among them kind of thing. Uh, anyway, a pant hoot goes something like this. <laughs> <laughs> right, if you wanted to evolve language, you wouldn't start there. So there has to be some alternative precursor to work on. And what Jerome and I and our team are saying is there's another thing which chimpanzees do, not vocalizing, actually mostly silent, and it's called play. So all chimpanzees and monkeys, and of course many other animals, we know this, don't we? Kittens, and uh, when they're young, they're, they're wonderfully um, playful. Um, and the, the thing which Noam Chomsky perhaps contributed most to under, under our understanding of language is to stress the, the creativity of language use. That when, when, I get, when I produce a sentence, or when you produce a sentence, almost any sentence you can think of, it's probably the very first time 
in the entire history of the universe that that sentence was spoken. Uh, if somebody kept on giving you the same sentence again and again and again, you would, they wouldn't be, you know, you, you'd give up on them before long. You'd think they're a little bit boring. And the thing about chimpanzees is they tend to give the same, if you call it a sentence, the same pantu, the same food grunt, whatever it is, again and again and again. Language is creative, extraordinarily creative. So where did that creativity come from? Well, just look at any bunch of chimpanzees when they're young and they're playful. And, and of course, we all know that, don't we, with dogs? I mean, you, you can just go to a park here and watch the dogs playing. It's just beautiful. And one of the other things about the, the playfulness of other animals is how egalitarian it is. Do you know what I mean? You see a big dog and a little dog, and they're playing. And of course, the big dog knows that for the game to continue, it's got to keep losing the game. If the big dog, dog keeps winning and biting and chasing, that little dog's going to you know, it's not going to be much fun and it's going to go somewhere else. So the big dog, in order to keep the game, the, the, the game going, it has to sort of reverse roles and roll on its back and let the little dog run over it and bite its neck, of course, playfully. So there's something creative about play, unpredictable about play, kind of useless about play, because the whole point of play is not functional, directly functional, um, and kind of egalitarian. And it does involve turn-taking and um, kind of role reversal. Um, and so I'm going to be arguing from now on the rest of this evening that building on play, on the play instinct, we can get to language. And immediately that brings up the question I was mentioning earlier about sex. Because why does the playfulness of young chimpanzees come to a, an end? So what happens is that you might get two chimpanzees, they're wonderful playmates when they're young, and then their hormones start to rage. You've got two chimpanzees, maybe they're both males, and they've been play fighting. Uh, and then, uh, right, sex is involved. Um, and once sex is involved, you can't afford to lose. Um, a chimpanzee that's not capable of fighting, that keeps losing the fights, that chimpanzee's genes won't be around uh, very much longer. Suddenly, when sex comes along, it's, it's too important. And the, what happens, of course, is that the play fight becomes a fight. And adult chimps, they, they don't play. They're not at all playful. They might play, actually, with a, with an in, with a juvenile. So an older chimp might allow a, a juvenile chimp to play, if it's usually it'll be because it's related. But adult chimps don't play with each other. You see two um, silverback gorillas meeting, and it's not going to be playful. It's going to be a big fight over who has the females. So can you see what I'm saying? Plays there, but it, the, play, the games which are played among immature, immature chimpanzees, the actual form of the game being played won't survive to the next generation. It won't be played in adulthood, it won't be passed on, and so each game is kind of reinvented at each generation. And what we need in order for language, not just language by the way, the whole of symbolic culture to get off the ground, is some way in which let's pretend, let's pretend play um, survives into adulthood and clearly there's need something to do with sex uh, is going to be needed here given that it's the sexual conflict which prevents play play fighting from getting down into the next generation because it, it, it just can't survive into adult, adulthood um, so play is crucial and what I'm especially talking about now is pretend play now actually Play fighting is a sort of pretend play. You know, you're biting somebody, but it's not a real bite. And the anthropologist Gregory Bateson made this point that uh, a playful nip, it's a bite, but not really. It's, a, it's a, like a bite with a negative sign on it. This is a bite, but actually it's not a bite. It's just a playful bite. A, a nip is what he called it. Already you can, you can argue that a, a, a playful nip is a not bite and therefore a kind of symbol it's a symbolic bite and all the other chases and scratches and you know actions taken in rough and tumble play if they're not intended really what's changing the nature of the behavior is the cooperative intention it's a bite but it's intended playfully so behind the behavior is a is a is an intention which sort of contradicts the surface meaning of the uh, behavior um, so, in a way, the whole of language, but not just language, the whole of symbolic culture, it's, it's, if it's let's pretend, if it's action but not really,
can you see there's a sense in which it's, it's false, it's not real. And, that, and that, that's actually part of the definition of a symbol, that it's, it's, it, it's not real. Um, maybe a way of explaining this, this would be, um, okay, that's, that, here we are. So you just tell me, what's this? Pretty, pretty simple. What was, what, um, what was that supposed to be? Aeroplane landing, okay. So, okay, can you see what's going on here? It's not an aeroplane landing. It's actually my ballpoint. And this is Chris Knight with his hand going, ah. But, you know, you got it. It's, it's not an aeroplane, but it is an aeroplane. So, okay, now I'm going to take another little step. What we now know, absolutely, and it's really a wonderful discovery, is that what I just did now there with this thing is an example of metaphor in an important sense. So at first sight you might not think it's metaphor, but I want to convince you that it is. <laughs> so what is metaphor? Well, first of all, in general, metaphor is the, cre is the generative principle behind historical language evolution. Historical linguists looking at how languages undergo change over historical time, they kind of worked it out that all our words pretty much and all our grammatical markers were originally very vivid metaphors which have become used and used and used and have become eventually what we call dead metaphors. They've become so conventionalized and familiar that we've even forgotten that they, they, they once were brilliant metaphors. But when they were brilliant metaphors, vivid metaphors, they were obviously not just fake, they were falsehoods. You might not have thought of this, that metaphor is a falsehood, but I just want to convince you. So, I mean, a classic cliche really is um, Shakespeare in Romeo and Juliet, the balcony scene, it's the morning, um, Romeo's been waiting for Juliet to appear, uh, and he notices it's getting towards sunrise, and everything's beginning to lighten up, and then Juliet appears, and um, Juliet is the sun. Well, a kind of um, a pedant could e easily object to that. I mean, what is the sun? I mean, we now know scientifically, don't know, it's a huge ball of hot gases up in the sky, hydrogen atoms fusing to form helium. Um, and Juliet was clearly not that. She's <laughs> a member of the human species, female. And of course, the, the point of the metaphor is to capture something about the sun and Juliet, which they both have in common, which I suppose you could put in the word, maybe it's her radiance. The sun is radiant and Juliet's radiant. But, but you can see, can't you, that Juliet is the sun is not true, it's a falsehood. But when we, when we humans, when we're on speaking terms with each other, we're giving each other falsehoods the whole time. Everything's false. But instead of saying, oh, that can't be true, which you would actually if you're, if you're severely autistic, okay, if you're severely autistic, you, you keep getting f infuriated by these obvious untruths. <laughs> There's some wonderful comic books with about all that. Um, because we're on speaking terms with each other and somebody says something which isn't true, what do we do? We're on speaking terms. So we, we look behind your falsehood to an intended meaning which is true. So we're, we're, we're prepared to tolerate falsehood, assuming honesty, assuming some truth behind it. So, um, and, now, and now what is now known is that all the, even the most complex features of human language emerge that way so that they're, they are originally um, Originally falsehoods, which become accepted, and then they gradually settle down and settle down and settle down until they become words. That's one route, but also if, they, there's con they, if, the, con if the process of familiarization and abbreviation and routinization continues, you can get abbreviated and abbreviated and abbreviated, and then some of those words become, b begin to function as grammatical markers. Again, the standard example, one of the standard examples, almost a cliche these days, is um, in English, the future tense mar marker. So we, we, if, we, if we say about the weather, we're looking at the dark clouds and we say, it's going to rain. At first of all, you might think that's not a metaphor at all, but actually it is. And you'd realize it was a metaphor if we said it's traveling to rain, walking to rain, or running to rain. If we say it's going to rain, we're imagining um, I'm going to London, she's going to Paris, the weather's going somewhere f to someone else. We're using, um, we're using movement through space, going somewhere, 
in order to convey an idea about movement through time. So we're treating time as if it were space, which it isn't. Time isn't space, it's very different. So now what happens is you say it's going to rain, and that starts to get abbreviated. And, uh, and colloquially we all say it's going to rain. Okay, now the point about that is you've got to think of gn there, it's gonna rain. And if I said it's gonna rain, even though I didn't say it's going to, you'd probably know that gn means it's future tense. And so <laughs> gn is on the way up to becoming a future tense marker, a future tense prefix. But note that it's just in that context that it becomes abbreviated. Because if I said, I'm, 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 you know, I, maybe I'm, I'm going to Paris tomorrow. If I said, I'm gonna Paris, <laughs> it doesn't work. So what we've done, we've, we've, we've abbreviated going to, which is traveling to, walking to, running to, but only in that context when it's becoming increasingly used as a, as a grammatical marker. And the point now is that we, we now know that all grammatical markers um, evolve in something like that way. They're originally metaphors and they get compacted and compacted and compacted down. Now again, I'm, I'm constantly trying to uh, uh, urge you to think about the origins of all this and go back to chimpanzees. The point about chimpanzees is that they're not, they haven't got that tolerance. As soon as a chimpanzee comes against something which could be false, it kind of loses interest, so it probes the signal to find out whether there's any evidence for it. And this is one of the remarkable features of language. There's, a, there's quite a few features of language which are absolutely extraordinary, remarkable. Um, one of them is digital structure, which is what I was saying earlier. You can, you can just remove a consonant and switch the whole meaning um, to, to maybe to its opposite. Um, but the other is this, what's called displaced reference. When we speak like, we're doing, like I'm doing now, nothing that I'm describing is happening in this room. There are no chimpanzees here, there's no Juliet, there's no, I mean, none of the, none of the stuff I'm talking about is in the room. Um, so when non-human primates communicate, they're communicating about the here and now, and they need to communicate about the here and now because the listener can check that out. You can check out the here and now. If you're talking about stuff that might have happened, you know, a year ago, it might be happening in the future, something you dreamed, dreamed about last night, there's no way that anyone can check out. And this is the amazing thing about us humans. You know, we just don't care. We're interested in what each other are, are, are saying. So even if it's a long, complicated fairy tale, it can be still very interesting. It's not that we, we do care, eventually, you know, somebody says something which is maybe a lie, but to start with, we don't, we don't, we don't object to the first vowel, the first consonant, we don't say, right, prove it, immediately, in the way non-human primates do. Non-human primates, like, they stop each other right at the beginning, forcing the signaler to repeat. It's almost as if I wanted to say something like, I'm going to, and you stop me there. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, and, uh, and soon I'm, I'm repeating the same syllable again and again and again because you won't let me get any further. We give each other infinite trust in the sense that we just want to know what the intention is. Um, and so that allows us to cut down the cost of the signaling down and down and down until it becomes zero cost digital um, uh, signaling. Um, now, finally, just to put this all together if I can. Um, the theoretical linguist, Chomsky, uh, uh, foremost among these, so, says something absolutely brilliant. Chomsky's definition of language is this, it's digital infinity, or discrete infinity as he calls it. It's absolutely right. Language is a system of digits, zero cost signals, and we can combine these digits, and there are a limited number of these digits, there's a limited number of vowels vowel or consonants in any language, um, and we combine them in an infinite variety of ways. Um, now, what I'm arguing is that when we say that, we're just looking at one end of a spectrum. We're looking at the cheap digital end of something, which is not all digital and is not all cheap. And this is a point made beautifully by my colleague um, Jerome Lewis, who does field work in, with the forest people, the Bayaka people in the, um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Congo. And for the Bayaka, um, there's no, there's not, there's, there's no such thing as language in a way which, which doesn't grade into singing and into playfulness and into ritual and into, into laughter. We have a, we have a complex um, tapestry of gestures and signs, some vocal, some, some visual, and they all grade into each other. And if, you, if you're a theoretical linguist, you'll just home in on that 
cheapest, most efficient, most quick digital end of the spectrum, ignoring all the other stuff that's going on. Um, now the other stuff going on, at the other extreme, we have what's called ritual. Ritual is by definition the opposite of language. I mean, it's partly my definition, and I'll explain what I mean in a moment, how it got to be that way. But with ritual, you don't just say it, and that's it. Okay, I've said it once. So you're, 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 you're banging a drum. You don't just say, right, bang, there you are, that's it. You keep on drumming and 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 drumming. And with singing, or any kind of music, you don't just give them your audience a little bit. Okay, that's the tune, there you are, there you are that's it. You know. You've got to sing, and it takes a long time. And it doesn't matter how much you repeat the song, maybe slight variations so it doesn't get too boring, but it's always interesting. So ritual is costly signaling, and it's costly because only by going through the entire performance can you prove that you mean it, can you prove your commitment. So the longer you sing with each other, the more drumming you do with each other, the more rituals you perform with each other, especially if they're costly rituals, the, the tighter your community, the, the stronger your bond. Um, and my argument is as follows. It's that precisely the costly signaling, the ritual signaling, at that end of the spectrum, which generates the trust essential for the cheap signaling to be possible. So the costly signaling and the cheap signaling, the rituals and the words, if you like, they reinforce each other and make each other possible. But it's, spe it's especially one way round, in my view. It's the ritual which makes the language possible because the ritual is the ritual action which generates the necessary um, trust. Um, right, last bit. Um, how was it possible for the, the human voice to start producing lies, and I say lies because by chimpanzee standards they would be lies, in a way that was what we call evolutionarily stable. Now what I mean by that is if you, if you, say, if you keep telling each other lies, if I, keep, if I was to say things to you the whole time which would obviously not worth listening to, they were just lies, after a while you'd know, right, okay, don't listen to that guy, he's lying. And that would apply right through it, evolution, right into the distant past. So non-human primates, they can lie. They do sometimes deceive each other. But what is interesting is they don't do it with their voice. They do it with their whole body, and the, including their hands. They can deceive each other. But their voices are overwhelmingly honest because they find it impossible to manipulate their vocal signals. Pretty much impossible. And the reason being, of course, they need the, because the voice is needed to travel across distances, to work in the dark, to reach um, listeners who can't immediately check things out, there has to be something about those sounds, something about them which is intrinsically persuasive, which is hard to fake. And so the more difficult to fake the sound is, the more convincing. And so, of course, natural selection works on the anatomy to make vocal dexterity impossible, because a vocally dexterous chimp wouldn't be listened to. So, okay, if that's the rule, how, how is it that humans escaped that logic? How is it that we became supremely brilliant at using the tongue and other parts of our vocal apparatus, the, the speech articulators, to move all the sounds we, we, you know, we, we, we want, incredibly rapidly, extraordinarily complex muscle movements involved, uh, with the tongue being the central articulator? How is that even possible? And what would it be in the beginnings of it all? Um, again, read Wild Voices, but Jerome's come up with, I think, a brilliant answer. And the, and the answer is this, that originally, we evolving humans were not telling lies to each other. We were telling lies, that's, that's not quite the right way of saying it, but anyway, we were producing vocal deceptions targeted at creatures that couldn't fight back. So we were evolving as hunters. And all hunters, you know, have to use all kinds of clever tricks of ambush and surprise and tracking to be able to track down the animals without them suspecting in order to kill them and cook them and eat them. And Jerome, from his field work, he just, just discovered that the, the, the Bayaka people are extraordinarily clever at producing the sounds around them. Extraordinarily clever at producing the sound of a little dica, that's a little antelope that wants to play. So you make the, play, the let's play sound to this little dica, and it comes running up towards you, 
um, as if it wants to play and you know, no, you're actually going to try and kill it with your spear. And the sad thing if you're a, an animal lover and a or a vegetarian is that it never gets it. So if it manages to escape, you just make the little sound again and it comes up to play again. And it, and it, get, and it just cannot get that this sound is a, is a fake. Because of course, in the wild, how many times does it come across a human? I mean, you know, compared with the times it comes across the genuine version of the signal. So what Jerome's done is he's, he's, he's worked out an extraordinary ability of the people he was working with to mimic the sounds of the animals they hunt. Um, and the animals themselves don't have enough evolutionary time to evolve through very slow Darwinian natural selection countermeasures. So initially, men were using their, their voices um, to deceive game animals as part of the hunt. Meanwhile, evolving women were doing something very different. And he noticed that the, um, the women among the Bayaka are kind of the opposite. When they're out in the, in the forest, they keep very quiet. Um, sorry, well, they, they, keep, they, they, they don't want to alert the animals, but when the men make these um, vocal sounds imitating the voices of the animals, the women do something very, very different. Um, and they, they want to scare away the, the more dangerous animals by uh, singing. So they'd have this polyphonic singing which conveys to the animals um, an impression of a large group of people. So Jerome actually asked the women, why do you sing all night? Why do you sing so, so long, so, so energetically? Of course, the women love the singing. It's you know, very empowering. They, they bond very closely to it, and they, they, they have a, an enormous amount of pleasure from this kind of singing. But the women explained, we're singing for our lives. Um, and so on the particularly dark nights, maybe especially around the dark moon, the singing keeps the animals away, because um, any, any predator would not really want to mess with a group that it couldn't work out the number of people involved. It's too risky. And so the singing is like, almost like the opposite. The two sexes are doing opposite things. But of course, everyone's got a mummy and a, and a daddy. Everyone, the, the two sexes strategies um, blend and merge. And, and according to the theory we've developed now, what happened is that this capacity for singing, combining with the capacity for vocal mimicry, kind of led to language, but I want to explain the last bit of the theory now. I've already said that um, metaphor is the generative secret of language. So you can have a kind of general theory, and it's good to have theories, and you haven't actually got to be right with a the theory, by the way, in science. You've just got to have the best available theory. Every theory is going to be wrong. At some point, it's going to be superseded. But we do think, actually, that we've got, so far, the best theory because it's almost like the only theory. There's no other theory which even tries to put everything together in the way that our model uh, does. But vague general theories aren't very good because it's hard to test them. The most powerful theories are those which are very vulnerable, vulnerable to being disproved um, because they make very specific, maybe unlikely um, predictions. And it's when you tease out the inter internal logic of your working hypothesis, you then make predictions, you then test your predictions against all the possible relevant evidence, and especially invite your critics to knock your model down. That's when, if, that, if your model survives that testing in the light of evidence, that's when you have um, a really powerful um, theory. So what we wanted to do was to say, OK, it's fair enough to say metaphor was the secret, but maybe what was the first metaphor? Can we, can we nail it down? So one of the points I've always made is that if you're looking for a theory of the origins of language, you'll probably look forever because there's no such thing. You can't have a separate theory of the origin of language because the emergence of language is part of a much more complex whole. It was, it was a, a one component of the evolutionary emergence of the whole symbolic cultural domain. So what happened? Well, we've already given you the last few lectures what we think happened. So it was quite simple really, given what we've been talking about earlier. The evolving human female found it more and more necessary to form female-female alliances, first of all for childcare, and then for something different. So what began to happen was that, and I, I probably won't go into all the menstruation stuff which we dealt with um, a couple of weeks ago, 
But what began to happen was that the, the solidarity which women um, mobilized among themselves for childcare purposes, they found they could use for a new purpose. They, could f they found they could use their solidarity as leverage to get males to behave. So, okay, um, th this would have been connected with the beginnings of hunting. And you can see immediately when you think about it, what is hunting? It's a form of violence. Um, males can use spears against animals, and of course they can use spears against each other, and of course they can use you know, violence against women as well. Um, so what had to happen was that females began to use their solidarity, initially developed for childcare purposes, holding each other's babies and, and, and all that, begin to use that as a leverage against badly behaved males. And this is what I call the women's strike theory of human origins, or if you like, it was a strike, but it was not, it was a women's strike, but a sex strike as well as a quicking strike, the whole thing, just going on strike. So quite simple, and I said at the beginning, the first word was no, so males want sex. Um, the females increasingly found it was helpful for them to gang up with each other, bond with each other, and make it very clear that if men want sex, they're going to have to be, make themselves useful. Um, and so go on strike uh, it, whenever they needed to. Um, now, how do you, without language, you can't have language yet, we've got to get there. How does a group of females signal in the loudest, most clear possible way, um, no sex? And what we think is this, it was very simple, they would just reverse the signals which signal yes. So there's a branch of biological evolutionary theory which discusses what's called a mate recognition system. So imagine a moth. The female moth needs to mate with the male moth and she gives out pheromones. And the male moth in the night picks up the scent and it needs to know, right, this is a, f a moth, same same species as me in other words. This is a female that's opposite sex to me and she's in a fertile period. So it's the moth needs to signal with the pheromones same species, different sex, fertile period. And that really applies for courting ritual, make recognition across sexually reproducing species. To find each other the female has to signal to the male, maybe the male signals to the female of course. Um, but a female chimpanzee, for example, will signal when she wants sex um, very loudly, clearly in body language that she is absolutely a chimpanzee, not some other kind of creature. Um, she's definitely female uh, and she's ovulating. Can you see what that gives you if you're going to say no sex? You just reverse it all. So you reverse, and remember this is play, this is playful, this is let's pretend. In order to get something done, a group of women now put on a, a performance, wrong species, so you turn into animals, maybe the zebras or game animals that you want the men to hunt. You reverse the sex, so you're a male version of the animal we want the men to hunt. And if you're doing it around the menstrual period, you're signalling, right, kind of not the fertile time, not immediately fertile time. So wrong sex, wrong species, wrong time. Now that, I hope you'll agree, that's very improbable extremely unlikely, rather weird, yeah? <laughs> Good, I want, you, I want you to realize that it's weird and very unlikely. Um, then, then please, just check it out. Because um, possibly the world's best documented, really ancient ritual um, comes from Southern Africa among the Bushman people. And it's called the Eland Bull Dance. And it's performed at the time of a girl's first menstruation. And it's exactly what I've described. The women dance around the girl who's now constructed, not as a girl any longer, but as, a, as an animal, the eland. The eland is this massive, beautiful al eel, uh, antelope that they love to hunt with lots and lots of fat on it. And it's not just an eland, it's a male eland. It's an eland bull. And the girl, in becoming an eland bull with her at her menstruation, it's a, it's a wounded eland bull. And the, cru the crucial thing here is that what women had to do and going on strike is declare, it's, this is the basis of all the world's religions by the way. Uh, I'm not 
religious myself, um, although I was brought up a Roman Catholic. Um, but I do understand the value of at least this fundamental principle, which is that some things are sacred. Uh, and if the body isn't sacred, nothing is sacred. And because women are not so good at one thing compared with men, um, violence, if, it's, if the game is violence, men will probably on average you know, win that game. But we had to get out of that. Um, women particularly needed to establish my body as sacred, no means no. And using the blood of menstruation and reversing all the mate recognition signals so that you become a sacred eland bull, and that is the animal, that is their divinity. If they've got a god, it's that eland, if you like, totemic god. That's it. It, it declares something that's sacred. Our bodies are sacred, and especially at this time around menstruation. And then just look around, please. You know, just look at other <laughs> other religions, hunter-gatherer religions. Uh, I think you'll find it's very hard to find counter evidence to what we say. I mean, there are, there are kind of conventional ways of describing what I've just given you. One of the conventional ways is totemism. Okay. So the classical idea is that the earliest form of religion was totemism. But now think what is totemism? It's the idea of your is that your kinship rules, the idea that you shouldn't have sex with your sister, you should respect your mother-in-law, all those things, they don't just apply to other humans, they apply to animals as well. Well, you've already got totemism, is what I've just described. If you have a picket line where women, while menstruating, are turning into an animal, and it's a wounded animal, can you see what's happening? The, 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 the blood of the animal, which you shed in hunting, has now become menstrual blood, from which we're, we're all descended. So you're already establishing, just through a ritual, your kinship with the animals and the sacredness of the animals. So you kill an animal, and if it's bleeding, it's sacred, you can't eat it. And the way to get rid of that taboo on consumption is to bring it back to camp, and the women can cook it, remove the visible blood, and make that raw and dangerous and tabooed flesh edible. So um, check it out. So. Um, what was, I'm going to finish now. I know we've almost we've run, running out of time. So, okay, so we have this let's pretend. And it's a, I said it early on, didn't I, that the root of languages, I did this thing with an aeroplane. Well, it, of course, it wasn't an aeroplane. It was an Elan bull. So you have a group of women performing a game of let's pretend. And we needed a, a game of let's pretend, which was, although fictional, was a fiction of such central importance that everything depended on it. And for those women, everything depended on preventing rape, preventing violence, preventing harassment, making sure that men understand if they want sex, they're going to have to behave. And the message you women would have given is, like, we're on strike now, there's no meeting camp, we're fed up, you know. Um, we're on strike, you're not going to get any sex, no good fighting each other for it, it won't work. Um, go away, come back in a few days' time, maybe around full moon with a zebra, um, and we'll think about it. So that, that, was, that would have been the, the logic of that um, game of Let's Pretend. And c you can see that it's not just a, a kind of irrelevant peripheral game. It would be absolutely central to avoid the consequences of m males not respecting the sacred, males breaking through that picket line. But now we have the last little bit of the theory, which is that if you're performing a, a game of Let's Pretend, it will go in two directions. So the, this this performance is first and foremost directed against the male of the species. And I've, I've said before, the biological human male, however nice we are and sensitive we are, we're not most attuned to hearing the word no. Um, there's something about being told no sex that there's a, a tiny little element, maybe quite a big element, <laughs> of resistance sufficient for it to be necessary to say it one or two times and to say it quite loud and clear. So the idea is that this ritual of wrong sex, wrong species would have to be repeated, amplified, a huge multimedia display, and, it, and a lot of song and dance, from which come, actually, the whole thing which we call song and dance. So at the, when, it, when, when encountering resistance, the signal has to be amplified, repeated, uh, and turned into a multimedia display. But now, think the other way around. Um, what about inside the coalition? And remember, of course, that all those women have their own sons and brothers. It's not about males versus females or females versus males. Everyone's a son and a brother as well as a sexual partner. So within that sex strike coalition, you've got males who would be supportive of their sisters uh, and their mothers. And now within the coalition, you have 
no need to amplify and repeat. There's sufficient trust now to go in the other direction. So you've got your big metaphor, and, and the metaphor is that a menstruating woman or menstruating women is like force, but kind of there's a truth behind it, are wounded game animals, and you need to respect both. That's the metaphor. You've got, a, you've got one fundamental primordial metaphor, but now within the coalition, there's sufficient trust to start um, making shortcuts, abbreviations, cutting up and splintering that, that big metaphor into little bits of metaphor in order to say this or that or the other to individuals within your group, now that you've got sufficient trust for listeners to accept these fictions. So what happens is that the, the pretend play goes in this direction as ritual, in this direction as speech, and the two, can you see what I'm saying? The two are opposite ends of the same spectrum, the head and tail of the same coin, they, they mutually support each other. The ritual supports the speech, but of course the speech can be, can be used to help organise um, uh, ritual. Um, and then just finally, um, I just mentioned the context we're in at the moment. Um, the, all this harassment and, and, uh, and, and patriarchal stuff. Um, and the fact that we've got the, we've got the internet and the social media which potentially could be language enabling all of us across the entire planet to just ignore these uh, patriarchal imposed borders. I mean the internet in a way doesn't care about borders and the social media don't care about borders any more than the moon or the sun care about borders or the game animals or the you know, birds care about borders but of course we have politics patriarchal politics and these borders are very important to them. Um, but we have this potential to use language to get together and dream of a future and make that future happen looking after the only living planet which we've, we've got. Um, but at the moment it's not working out that way and what we need is more than just language. We need some very, 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 very powerful bottom-up huge signal to say enough is enough. Um, men have you know, made a mess of things for the last few thousand years. I can't help mentioning, does anyone see this thing from Steve Bannon? Does anyone see on the all internet thing? Did he? Yeah. <laughs> Steve Bannon, for those of you who don't know, he was the chief strategist for Donald Trump um, until a few weeks ago. Um, he's, a, I, I think, a rather unpleasant person, in fact, very unpleasant person. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, the thing is, what's, he's, he's suddenly come out with it now. He's, he's very, very upset and worried and warning Donald Trump about the Me Too movement and the Time Is Up movement. And he's saying, we've got to get serious about this. This isn't just against sexual harassment. This, this isn't just Me Too. It's not just on a personal level. Women are going to take over. This is going to undermine, he actually puts the right figure on it, 10,000 years of patriarchy. Um, we've got to get serious and fight back. <laughs> So uh, it's kind of good that they're beginning to get a bit worried about the future of patriarchy. Um, but what's needed is a, a very big final push. Um, and it needs to be not just a few vowels and consonants, it means to be, needs to be an almighty roar. So, uh, all very controversial and uh, questions, please.